You are live. Hi, Facebook. This is Kendra Band Ambassador Lo Wheeler. I'm super excited to jump into a balayage utilizing one of my favorite Kendra products ever, the Blue Powder Lightener. I'm going to hop into a really soft but intentional balayage placement. So what I'm going to do is take my Blue Powder Lightener and mix it with 30 volume. And I've pre-sectioned out my dolly so that the front hairline is going to be the first thing that we start to work on. Let me just get her nice and stable here for us. There we go. So you can see my first section with my Kenra Blue Powder is going to be right over the left ear. And because I'm painting, I'm going to stand behind my client's shoulder and work back away from the face. This is one of my favorite tips because, as you know, when you're working with balayage, you don't want to over-direct in the wrong direction. I'm taking a good eighth, inch, eighth of an inch section and I'm going to hold each section super taut and feather the lightener generously, sweeping it over the surface of the section. And I'm not going to go all the way to the root for this application. I want big, bold placement. So in the finish, that will provide us with a very soft blend. I have my 30 volume. I don't ever like to open air paint with anything lower than 30 volume because I want the lightener to be strong enough to get a decent amount of lift, which in my opinion would be like four levels. I'm not going to be using saran wrap or uh, cotton in this application because I like to work super quickly through each section and those just add a little bit of an extra step but by all means I love to encourage stylists to do whatever makes them feel comfortable when I tend to use um, cotton the most is in scenarios where I have really fine strand balayage patterns and also on clients that have angel fine hair. That way it helps me to protect each section from bleed marks, which is super important. Okay, so I'm going to now drop down my next section. And a lot of times in balayage, you do see a lot of, uh, you know, options for patterns and placement. You know, you definitely could switch up and do Vs, Ws, single strands. Today, I am focusing on a lot of surface coverage, and I cannot wait for you to see the end result. This is going to give us a very soft, diffused um, look at the end of the session. Just know that when you isolate like a single strand, for instance, and you have nothing in the next section over, you're creating a lot of dimension because there's a big amount of contrast between the strand that you're painting in the negative space that you're leaving out. So that will actually give you a really bright pop. The way that I'm doing it with these big, large, sweeping, saturated sections, there's not gonna be a lot of contrast here. So in the end result, it will be a super soft blend. Now I'm gonna move right along. How to large and what are the chips of your sections? What are the How large shapes? and what are the shapes of your sections? So I'm taking a good amount of hair 
around the ear and along the nape. So you want to make sure it's up to you how thick you want your sections, of course. But if you, I do recommend if you can see through the section, it is not thick enough for balayage. The objective is to not allow the product to sink through each section. So I'm taking a good level of thickness so I'm not pushing the product through. And then the shape of the section is just um, horizontal. Horizontal sections along the back hairline. And I'm starting in the back and I'm starting on each side of the ears and then moving back so that I can get some nice transitions and placement moving through my total look. Jessica's asking, are you saturating only through the ends? I am actually not really even saturating the ends for this one. When you saturate through the ends, you can definitely get a more of a poppy look, but I'm not really saturating through. If you notice me ever doing this, that would be an instant of me like saturating. So I'm doing that through this section just so we could see the difference. But the previous sections didn't really get saturated. When you are trying to create like a overall soft blend, you might want to plan what areas are gonna be better for saturation and what areas will be good as a surface painting. But I like to know that basically all my clients in reality have some kind of color already pre-existing in their hair. So it's something to consider when you're like building more character with your balayage sections. Do you use the clear film to cover each section? I love film when I am working in really cold environments because then at that point you would need some additional support to create the heat that will give you the lift that you're looking to um, achieve. But for the most part, I like to balayage levels five and up. And, you know, being in California, we don't really have like really cold seasons and even in the air conditioning I still you know like to work in the natural light and it's never like frigid in my salon but if you're working on levels five or lower you're going to need the extra heat and if you're also working in a you know geographic area that gets really cold you're going to want to encapsulate and use heat but there's a lot of my clients, I transition them into foils if I'm ever worried about it. I don't force uh, balayage into what I'm doing if it's not going to get me the results I want. I do it when I have a client that wants pretty soft, subtle dimension and buttery colors in the hair. How do you avoid bleeding? There's so many things that are going to be so awesome for avoiding bleed marks. I think like at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that you mix your product in a thicker texture because you don't want to have loose product that's sliding everywhere and then touching other sections. You want to make sure that you use enough product and that you keep all your implements clean and organized. Like if I put this section in the bath with like no intention, like I could get a bleed mark. So just like working clean. I like to mix my blue powder lightener two to one and that gives me a nice thickness. Lauren is asking, can you talk about why you hold your brush like that? Okay. So I like to 
angle my brush at a horizontal because it helps me to sweep across a bigger surface space. And also, if you come in at a vertical, you're more likely to push the product into the hair rather than sweeping it across the hair. You know, balayage, you really want to surface paint to avoid bleed marks. And so you don't want to push the product into the section. You want to paint it along the surface. And with this area, let's go ahead and do a little saturation and move to the other side. Again, I have 30 volume. I never touch a balayage <laughs> with anything, you know, weaker than 30 volume unless they're a platinum blonde level 9, 10, 11 blondes. Um, just because balayage will only give you a certain amount of lift. So you have to make a good judgment call. If you are looking to create a really ashy, dimensional, contrasted color, balayage might not be the approach that you want to go with. If you have a client that has years of buildup, maybe from box color or gray coverage, they might not be a good balayage candidate just because you have to really anticipate the end results that you're trying to achieve and set yourself up for success. Are you basically coating the top, the top of the hair? Yes, that is really like a key foundational principle with balayage. For this section, I really like to show you, it's like a 3D section. It's kind of like a little triangle. So I'm painting a peak of this section and then I'm making sure that I lay the lightener on the top of the section and simultaneously underneath the section. This is a very 3D way to do the hairline. And as I work through the last few inches, I will choose to saturate. This is just gonna give me a really cool effect in the hair. I really recommend trying it on a doll head or a hair model. I don't recommend experimenting with balayage on a paying client just because it's one of those techniques that I believe needs to be practiced and developed before you go experimenting um, on a paying customer. I think it's really important to, you know, develop yourself off hours before trying crazy things behind the chair, just because I think it's more professional. And as a salon owner, I'm like such a stickler for professionalism. And I just know myself that the times where you experiment on your client, like you're leaving a window open for you to like go down the wrong direction. So it's kind of like I've learned to provide new services or try experimental things on like either doll heads or like models um, just so that you could develop a skill set without having to like mess up on a paying client. I started balayaging probably like nine years ago. And I would actually start on just like the back of my clients' heads just to practice on them. And I, that's how I started, but I de definitely don't even recommend trying that like current date because you know, like you just want to make sure that you're skilled at whatever it is that you're offering as a service, right? I would know I wouldn't want to sit in the chair and then be somebody's science experiment. <laughs> this is kind of common sense, but I love teaching fresh, new, talented artists to just develop skills in the, the safest environment, which I believe is, you know, a lot of the time you have to come in after hours, before hours, bring your work home at times. And I know this is not a common thing millennials specifically like to do. 
Um, but I highly recommend it because it's taken me very far in my career. So it's like a good thing to keep in mind as you, you know, build your skill and your success. Now I'm coming around the hairline and I'm staying consistent with these three dimensional sections. I have my 30 volume blue powder lightener. So I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. First, to ask in, what's your favorite brush mm -hmm. when you're balayaging? Mm -hmm. They're also asking, would you do thinner pieces towards the face for a money piece? Mm -hmm. And about the liner that you like to use for balayaging. Okay, so the last question I'll answer first. This is my favorite lightener of all times. It's the Kenra Blue Powder Lightener. See how it has like a blue reflection in it? I love it for balayage because it has brass canceling in the formulation. And it also offers up to eight levels of lift safely. So I love it because when you're doing open air, you need a potent product to be able to secure the result that you're trying to achieve. So that is my favorite, favorite lightener of all times, I've tried a bazillion <laughs> and five different lighteners and have like loved, you know, discovering what is important to me with my lighteners. So for example, I've used other lighteners in the past where they offer like high lift, but what I've learned that I love the most with this lightener is how it swells and develops in basically what I can expect from this lightener is a really consistent and good um, texture. I know I've experimented in the past with like competitor lighteners where they just swell and get kind of like silky and slimy. And when that happens, it's just harder to control. So this one, it gets more like grainy as it expands and that's actually what I prefer with my balayage because it's not like getting silkier, more wet, and then, you know, interfering with my process. So I really love my lightener because of that. Um, another thing, what was another question was, what is my favorite color brush? Correct. I really love, my Fermar color brushes, they have a variegated tip on each little bristle. So it's kind of like painting with a makeup brush instead of like, you know, a flat bristled brush. But, you know, I've had like a lot of serious training for, um, for balayage and I've had, I've learned like European balayage, where they have really flat brushes, where it's like really hard edge. But I don't know, I just come to learn to love the softness of my Fermar brushes and mixed with my blue powder lightener. It's like my secret combination that I just like love so much. And the last question, I can't remember. Um, how thin, or I guess what's the size for the money piece? Like how thin are your sections? Again, you don't want to like see through your section because if you're seeing through it, you're going to be more susceptible to have bleed marks. Um, so my section's probably about, gosh, I want to say like a fourth of an inch thick. It's like not super thick. Same for the money piece, correct? Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the money piece. Like the um, sections that I started off with in the back behind the ear and the nape. I just take larger sections there because I'm really looking for speed. And as I look towards or work towards the money piece, I'm looking more for detail and effect. So the more small the width of the section that I place, the more detail I'm really looking for. But when you're going into like the back area of the head, you really want to you know, take as much surface space as possible to just lay the product on and be able to get the the um, application done as fast as you can. I feel like 
we spend so much time as stylists like worrying about being so like cautious and a perfectionist in the back that by the time we get to the front, like the back's done and your time slips away. So I like to just like lay larger sections through those back areas because it really is the front of the hair that's the most important to the client. And so that's where I wanna spend my time. That's where I want to have the most lift most in most cases. And that's where my client's gonna judge my work based off of, right? Is that front statement piece. Okay, so I'm mixing a fresh bowl of lightener plus my 30 volume. I love my 30 volume for all balayage that I'm looking for three to five levels of lift. It must be 30 volume <laughs> or else we would be there processing for like a bazillion hours. <laughs> so I'm whipping that together two to one roughly. And I'm keeping my Fomar brush really nice and clean because when you work with clean instruments, you're just setting yourself up for success. Now, this is my next section. This is the interior of the hair. And the interior is the section where I would like to see, you know, dimension here. I don't want to necessarily balayage all this or I will lose that dimension. So I'm just going to tip out the very ends and leave this whole upper zone of the hair just as depth. A lot of hairstylists believe that you have to touch every section of the hair through the temples to do a complete job. But in this case, less is more, and I really need and rely on that area to serve me as like a depth and a dimension. So I'm just tipping out the lower half of the section on both sides, and then I'm gonna create these big, beautiful sheets of color along the top. Dollies are like impossible to smoothly show balayage because with, if I were to have this as like a human client, I would easily have her work with me and move her head and we would create a lot of ease with the placement just based on that we would work together. And I wouldn't have to like constantly fiddle around with the neck of the doll. But we're just having fun with this today and just doing like the best we can with it. How long do you usually let a process for? I like to plan for a 45 minute processing time. And if I can't get the results that we're discussing in a 45 minute processing time, I lower the expectations of my client because I really can't emphasize enough how important it is to get to know your expectations before you get into the middle of like a color correction or a lengthy process because you want to be super diligent and intentional before you create obstacles in you know your service that you're providing so if i can't get something somebody in and out within a few hours what needs to happen is I need to book them multiple sessions, right? Because it's just being realistic with your clients. I've learned that goes a long, long, long way. So if it can't be processed in 45 minutes, the client really needs to expect less. <laughs> Without saturating the ends right through, can you create an uneven patchy color? Definitely, there is a give and take with that. You, saturating, you know, if you surface paint, you're going to get more lift. If you saturate, you will get more coverage, but potentially less lift. It's whatever you're trying to create, you have to practice to not get the patchiness. Like, 
at this point, if you're getting patches, you need to practice on a doll head. Like I, I highly, highly feel so like passionate about that. You have to understand your product. You have to um, be able to have your sections and your tensions be able to um, be executed in a way that you have full control over it. And if you're not controlling your sections, then you have to get in there and practice more. Like practice does create the confidence and the process of what you're going to get. So I just can't say enough. It's like not any magic tip is going to be like a guarantee that you don't get blotches. It's the practice that you put into your work that's going to make sure you don't get blotches, right? Would you be able to explain negative space? Yes. Okay. So I love negative space. Negative space is really what you're looking at and consciously opting out of your color placement. So this whole area is what I would call negative space. This negative space is going to help this painted section to really be bold, beautiful, and contrasted. So if we did her whole head feathered all the way to the top with no negative space, we would create the least bit amount of dimension. By leaving the negative space in there, you're creating the highest chance of dimension. She has like this little highlight. So I'm just going to scoop it over here because I just want a really clean finish on her. But again, I'm taking pretty large diagonal sections and I'm working from bottom to top because I don't want to disrupt my pattern. So I'm going to comb this section. I just want it to be nice and clean. And then I'm holding it as taut as I can without tipping my doll head. But your tension is also something so important when it comes to avoiding bleed marks. If you are holding the section willy-nilly, see how much opportunity I have to push product through where it doesn't belong. So you don't want to be like weak with your tension. You always want it to be as stiff and flat as possible. So just being able, that's my puppy, sorry guys. Um, just being able to control basically your motor skill, your viscosity and texture of your product, and then your tension, like all of those things are like instrumental in helping you to get a really good result. So if one of those things is off, it could be a bleed mark, right? So you wanna make sure that you practice and you have your tension, your motion, your patterns and your mixing ratios all setting you up to work in your best interest. Do you tone afterwards? Mm -hmm. Always. I always tone my balayages because it's important because anytime you bleach the hair, you're opening up that cuticle. And the only way to properly shut down the cuticle is to chemically do it with a demicriminant. So it goes in and the alkaline qualities of it closes the cuticle. So whether or not it has a tent is up to you. But I, if there's lightener going on my client's head, there's demicriminant closing down the cuticle. Because what that also does is it makes the hair shiny, makes it manageable, and the tone that you can create with it is just another level of what's going to set you apart as a really great uh, color expert. Okay, so here I'm taking a vertical, uh, I'm sorry, a horizontal section. How much time do you book yourself for an application like this in the salon? I would schedule a three hour session for her. And I would fly through it because I, when I'm having a conversation and talking to my client about their maintenance or their home care routine or whatever it is that we're talking about, I work super quickly. So I would have her whole head 
um, blonded within 15 to 25 minutes, depending on how long and full her hair is. Obviously, I would look a little bit longer if she had like waist long hair and like a thick ponytail. But I feel like if you have a client that has like three hairs, <laughs> it's going to be so easy to get a placement, a quick placement. Okay, so we're working up on the top section. And so I'm going to take this hunk of hair, split it in two. And then we're getting closer to the end of our blonding class today. So I'm going to be working on this front crown section and tipping out the end. Would you bump your liner as you're going up the application or would you keep the same? I would just keep mixing fresh batches of 30 because you know the first 10 minutes of a bowl of lightener is the most potent. So oftentimes what I see is if you mix too much product and then you let that product develop over 30, 40 minutes and then with that last little scoop in the bowl, you hit the back end of the hair where it's like really tough and stubborn, like you will not get the same lift as that first section. So I mix fresh, fresh, fresh product as I go. And every scoop of Kenra Blue Powder Lightener, I know I can work with that amount of lightener within like a 10 to 15 minute like time frame. So I know like if I'm only going to have 15 minutes of like really potent lifting power and then I'm only using a, one little scoop that's going to cover 15 minutes of whatever I can manage to blonde. I'm just going to always, always be using fresh, fresh, fresh and getting like the best level of lift possible. And that way you don't have to like resaturate or like worry. And even if I only had like one ribbon left and I had um, basically mixed fresh product, I know that one little ribbon is worth mixing fresh product for because I think that the hard thing about balayage is basically when you tone it, you are going to look at a lot of revealed warmth, but you don't want all this beautiful level eight lift and then like a brassy red part patch in the back because you miss the opportunity to remix, right? So always mix fresh, fresh, fresh all the time. Do you ever use the paint board? I have in the past, I've messed with it. I think that gets like super fun to play around with like as much tools and education and methods and patterns as possible because it's just context around your own personal development and artistry. Um, I feel like I kind of train myself to use my hand as like a board. So it's just kind of my flow. I'm very minimalistic. <laughs> so if you watch me work or if you're in like any one of my like online programs, you'll see that I keep things so simple because I see the minimalism and simpleness as like a time saver and time is money. So you'll see me just keep things so simple. So what I'm gonna do through the back is I want her to have pops in the front and just super soft blend out in the back. So realistically, this whole section is the same length. So if I go painting up all of this interior, you're never going to see that or appreciate it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hold my last section really firm and just how it will fall. And I'm going to just peek out the ends. You could tease if you feel like you want to tease. The thing I like about teasing is it's kind of like a security blanket or like a training wheels in a lot of ways, because if you're not confident in your blending, that tease will help you to blend. Like if you, we all have a different like heavy hand, right? Like I've seen so many artists balayage and some are like 
beep, 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 where it's like so light handed. And then the next person that tries this section is going to be like that, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you want to make sure that you're kind of like in between in your saturation and you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing that you have full control. So if you are one of those that needs to tease, like go for it. There's like clients that I sometimes feel like I want to tease and some clients I don't. It's just depends on like their hair texture, how fast you're able to move through the hair. I don't ever like approach any client like the exact same way every single time, but I have parameters of like what I know I'm able to offer and what I know I will not offer. <laughs> but I'm pretty flexible. Like one client will I'll tease do a little teasy pop out and the next client I'll do more of a face frame with no tease. Everybody's a snowflake, right? If we use this, would you do the same application if she had root color? I think that would work out really well because none of the balayage is like to the scalp. So if you had somebody that potentially wanted like, you know, gray blending, you could either basically do the gray blend first if you're fast enough to put on an entire balayage in like 15 minutes, then that would work out for you. If you're turtle slow and you take like 45 minutes to do a balayage, then you would maybe want to drop in the roots after. And in that case scenario, I feel like the Kenra Rapid Express permanents are like amazing. They're basically, you know, rapid permanent hair colors that process in like 10 minutes. And so if that was the case and I was taking 45 minutes to do this elaborate, gorgeous balayage and she had, you know, 20 or more percent grays and I really wanted to, you know, isolate those two services, I would then rinse her out, towel dryer, sit her up and then put on my um, rapid permanent color. Do you Rapid always Express. do, sorry, do you always do middle parting? Actually, with balayage, I have a lot of extended education that goes into all kinds of different ways to approach flipping clients that flip, side parts, side parts and middle parts. So basically, the answer is I customize every single balayage to what my client's preferences are. And... It makes it really fun and interesting. I always look at my client's hair as if it was on my hair, <laughs> on my head of hair. And I take them through, you know, the experience of like setting them up as like an annual client. And I work through their goals, seasonal changes with them. I work through like, you know, hair color placement based on whether or not we want to introduce fringe in the future. It's basically our artistry, right? So when we develop our skill as stylist, we want to take our client on a journey so that they're excited and they're anticipating basically all these amazing next chapters with us. And it, we're not like a one and done, you know, hairstylist or, you know, what's it going to be today, hairstylist, we inspire them and we teach them that basically their hair can be a personal expression and it can shift and change and it can, you know, have variations and it could also be a part of like how they show up into the world. Do you use heat ever with this technique? I never put my balayage clients under heat, but if you're like, you know, in Connecticut winter, <laughs> you're going to want to maybe consider that, right? So I don't have to rely on any of that being in like sunny California. I typically, if I need to spot treat with heat, then maybe it's circumstantial. Okay, so this last section is like perfect to wrap out round out this blonding class. So I did a chunky weave and I'm putting that hair aside. I'm gonna hold this section really tight. 
I'm going to do just a soft tip out. This is my favorite like hack for the back of the head, especially when you're, you know, trying to work super quickly. Like, I feel like this is just one of those things that you could even try like right away on any client because it's just such a easy life hack. So now I've like done my transition. I think I want to go slightly up on the sides here, soften it. Now I'm pulling this last chunky weave out and I'm going to just hold this section really tight. holding it in the mid shaft and I'm just feathering across all the sections at simultaneously. Soft blend up. This gives me kind of like that W effect without having that negative space in between each section. If this is your final section, you might wanna do a fresh bowl of lightener. You might wanna stick a foil underneath there and then close it on the top. If she's like a level six, you can just let it ride out. You can stick a little piece of cotton but see what I'm creating? I'm creating this like dimension through the back. And I know that is like a fail safe way to get a really pretty contrasted placement. Okay, guys, this is so much fun. Um, we have a very special contest. Who's ever the most amazing contest winner gets some amazing Kenner gifts, the blue powder lightener and some hand-picked toners by moi and i'm going to let um kendra and btc know exactly what my formulas are and one very very special winner will get a little um kendra kit of my favorite balayage recommendations we'll see you later thanks so much you can follow me at low underscore willer davis and i'll see you there